to thank you all for being a part of this Sankalp Dialogues. Uh, I welcome you all to the session. But before we dive in, I would like to start with some housekeeping rules. Uh, to avoid any disturbances, the audience has been kept on mute. For questions, please use the chat box. And if you have questions which are directed specifically towards someone, please write his or her name in brackets before you type out the question. Uh, please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat box because it's always good to know who else is in the audience. We have a, a pretty good Global South representation in terms of the re registrations. So uh, it will be good to know who is there. So you can definitely type out your uh, credentials in the chat box. And also please message IT Intellicap or Charu Tukral uh, in case you face any technical challenges. Uh, they'll drop you a chat in the chat box now so that you can recognize them. And in case of any technical challenges, please feel free to reach out to them. So, uh, yeah, uh, in terms of Sankal Dialogues, I'll start by saying that Sankal Dialogues is an effort to bring together people to initiate change and talk about things that truly matter. Today, we are venturing into the nexus of two very important themes, gender and agriculture and agricultural technologies. So we all know that women play an important role in agriculture across the global south. For instance, in India, agriculture sector uh, accounts for more than 80% of all 80% uh, of all economically active women in India are, are engaged in the agricultural sector. Similarly, in terms of self-employed farmers, 48% of the self-employed farmers in India are women. The statistics are very similar for other South Asian countries as well. In Sri Lanka and Bhutan, we have more than 50% of uh, women engaged in agriculture. Similarly, FAO estimates that in Sub-Saharan Africa, more than 50% of the workforce are engaged in agriculture are women. Uh, I would like to highlight out here that there is always a lot of underrepresentation also because women many times engage as in unpaid work and engage in the sector informally. So that is not accounted for. So actually, their contribution contribute to the agriculture sector could be much more. Uh, developing economies are also seeing a trend which is being referred to as the feminization of agriculture, which be at the same point of time, there's another disruption happening in the agricultural sector, which is likely to aid uh, food security. This is in the terms of agricultural technologies. Today, there is a consensus that by using ag tech, farmers can increase their productivity, can reduce the cost of cultivations, can get better prices for their output, and also reduce vulnerabilities uh, related to climate change and similar, similar situations. However, in our work in the agricultural sector, one thing that we have realized is that adoption of ag tech is very low amongst women farmers. Uh, while this is not completely attrib attributable to a gender lens, but we believe that the, the adoption in women farmers can considerably increase if the gender lens is used in the design, deployment, and commercialization of agricultural technologies. To illustrate this to the audience, I would like to uh, take a few examples. Uh, so normally, uh, whenever you develop a new product, what you start with is a needs assessment. I have seen many instances where, uh, while doing the needs assessment, there are te technology companies who are interacting with farmers, but very often women are excluded from these uh, interactions. So what happens is that needs don't get into uh, accounted for in the needs assessments. Similarly, there have been some cases where, uh, like whenever you deploy agricultural technology, handholding and capacity building goes along with it. But many a times, the people who are giving these handholding services are also do not include women. So in the in the actual implementation of these capacity building services, women are again excluded. I personally have worked a lot in the tea sector, and I'll give an example from here. Uh, that plucking, which is the most labor-intensive activity in the tea sector, has been done by women traditionally. But even now, when mechanical harvesters have been made, we never see women using these harvesters. So there is definitely something amiss. And I believe that for agricultural technology to reach full potential in terms of how it can disrupt the sector and help achieve food security, using a gender lens is a very important thing. Not only because of this business case, but also it has a very strong social case. Uh, one thing that I would like to highlight here is that the absence of a gender lens can actually put women at a disadvantage and further aggravate the gender inequalities that exist in the sector. 
So with this discussion uh, and this brief background, I thought that it is important for us to uh, ideate and understand from some of the key players in the stake stakeholders from the industry on how we can better design agricultural technologies so that women can, uh, uh, can be more amenable to using such technologies. With this brief background, I would like to uh, introduce our speakers. Uh, Charu, if you can play the slide, please. Uh, so our first speaker is Caroline. Caroline has led the work of notable impact funds such as Eunice School of Social Business, Mango Fund, and Mercy Corps Ventures. She's also been instrumental in shaping strategies for gender lens investing globally. Caroline sits on the boards of United Social Ventures, Aspen Network of Development Entrepreneurs, the East Africa chapter, and Finding XY. She's also a member of the boardroom Africa, Women, Women in Investments Africa, and the Africa List. Uh, we have Kunal, who is the co-founder and the chief operating officer of Cropin. Cropin today needs no introduction as they're one of the most innovative companies using data for agriculture. Kunal was a part of the team which has helped Cropin reach out to over 2.1 million farmers today over, in over 52 countries. Uh, he and his company have a mission to digitize 20 million farmers by the end of the year 2022. We have Soma Ma'am here, Soma Kishor Pathisarji Ma'am. Uh, Soma Ma'am has over three decades of field and policy related experience in the areas of gender, poverty, uh, development and livelihoods. She currently coordinates the National Network for Women Farmers, which is MAKAM, Mahila Kisan Adhikar Manch. She also provides gender analysis and advisory services to several agencies, allowing them to use a gender lens in their programs and operations. She has also worked with the government of India to facilitate gender inclusive policies and program development. And I am Srijit Borthakur. I work with the Intel, uh, agriculture team in Intelicap. So with this brief introduction, I would like to move forward with the session and pick up some interesting questions and uh, direct them to our speakers. So one of the first things that happens in any discussion around gender and agriculture is that we start with a description of the gender roles. But since we have Soma Ma'am here, who has a lot of experience of working in the grassroots, I would like to flip the question around a little. So my mom, so with your experience of working with farmers, how do you think women farmers perceive agriculture? Um, first, I'd like to thank you for having this panel. It's very, it's not very often we, that we have panels that focused on technology from a gender lens. So um, uh, this is a great initiative. And this whole thing about looking at women as part of the agricultural scenario is really something that is very current, necessary, so thank you for that. Um, when we look at, uh, let me also say that um, I am not the coordinator of Makam. Gargi does that job. I am one of the members um, If you can put up the slide, Charu. Yes, Am I audible? Okay, so I am one of the uh, members of the collective that is called the National Facilitation Team in Makam. We uh, formed our team in about five years ago to coordinate the activities, and we are now in 25 states, as I mentioned. So Makam's focus has been on marginalized women farmers. We work with small and landless farmers, tenant farmers, Dalit and Adivasi communities, and uh, communities below the poverty line are our focus group. So I would be speaking from that perspective perspective. And um, as you know, our priorities are to look at issues of recognition and visibility for women, strengthening capacities, and um, which includes institutional capacities and representation of women in institutional spaces uh, to enable women to gain entitlements and for resource rights. So um, this, this is the perspective from which I would be making my uh, contribution today. And um, first, I'd just like to highlight a couple of things before I get to your question, uh, Shijit. Uh, uh, what is it that women are doing? Are they really in the agriculture sector? This question is often thrown to us because the kind of attention that women receive is really a pittance. It scraps in the whole milieu of agriculture, really. But we know that more than 400 women uh, engage in agriculture and farm work across the world. In India, this number is more than 42% 
percent of the agricultural force, according to NCAER study. And although there is a decreasing work participation rate in formal data, this is um, Asha Kapoor Mehta of NCAER had attributed this in her study to the fact that their work is generally invisibilized and subsumed within the household labor and therefore not remunerated or recognized. We also know that women are in the agriculture and allied sector, producing more than 60 to 70 percent of our food and 90 percent of dairy products. So when you say that, uh, you know, the uh, responsibility is going to increase, yes, the responsibility is increasing, but they have already been bearing much of that responsibility. So we have to look at how technologies and other innovations can really help them in that process. Uh, much of the work that they are doing is left uncounted, and much of the action uh, activities that they uh, tend to be counted into are really seen as marginal. And uh, part of uh, some of these issues that we would like to highlight is really that if they are not recognized and the farmer is only seen from the lens of ownership of land, then women only own 2% of agricultural land in India, although they own 12% of overall land holding, and that has increased over the last two decades. But if 2% of agricultural land is held and decision-making and all the critical inputs are given only to those who are actually owning the land, then you can imagine how many of the, uh, how they're managing, they're struggling to manage this economy. So when it comes to the issue of actually looking at um, how do they see farming, um, they see farming, but, um, their worldview is about farming as a subsistence activity. And here again, I'm talking about the majority of women farmers who are landless or in batai systems or sharecropping systems or lease systems and have very little access to uh, ownership of pro uh, property and resources. So for these asset poor women farmers, subsistence is a priority. It's not about income. Income comes into the picture as wages and earning from surplus. Whereas the discourse, the macro discourse seems to be all about increasing incomes, increasing profits. These are the issues that they're dealing with. Hunger, starvation, so, migration and debt is very large in these subsistence houses. Similarly, they are every day to provide for needs of. Hello, can yeah. you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. There was a yeah. glitch in between. They work clear now. Yes, ma'am. Hundred, So, um, like I was saying, that when we talk to women farmers, women farmers are doing these activities of everyday chores of managing animals, managing household food needs, managing uh, community interests so that uh, the elders and the cattle and the poultry and everything is tended to. So their view of agriculture is really very localized, grounded, and a day-to-day, -day, everyday event. So um, they have to manage with the resources that they have access to and the work that comes their way to supplement whatever from the fields. The other thing I'd like to highlight is that women don't see uh, farming as an industry. As you mentioned in your introduction, women see it as in an activity to sustain households, livelihoods, and societies. This is from our experience is a very important perspective to bring in because that is where the issue of sustainability comes in. They're looking at an ecologically embedded view that responds to the daily changes in soil quality, moisture, crisis, and um, the needs of the environment as well, because they're able to assess that uh, right from the ground. And I can give you examples of how women tell you that the change in the direction of the wind overnight was something they had to adapt to in their sowing and in their nurturing of fields uh, in the mountain areas where I work. Uh, the other thing that we need to recognize is that women farmers are enterprising and innovating every day. It's not as if they wait for somebody to teach them that. They have to be on their feet thinking forward. Their households and their animals. Uh, and it has 
we were just talking before this session began about women have a policy because the markets did not allow them to access the buyers at the time that the lockdown happened. And this has been, a, so they've had to deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis. The other thing we need to recognize is that storage protection of seeds, soil, food, including wild foods. They supplement cultivated foods with wild foods. And in many areas, they even depend on wild foods mostly. The collection of fuel fodder are all a natural cycle of being produced. So this management of natural cycles of production and availability and storage which is something that they have been doing. And this is intergenerationally transmitted knowledge that the women holders of. And we need to recognize that even when we're discussing issues of technology applications for communities and agricultural economies. Um, one of the key things uh, that um, I would like to add here is that women don't all look at the agricultural system, the farming system, and, and these are not interchangeable words, but to say that the agricultural system is not uh, seen as something that is only for the household or individuated. The property regimes and the way the economies are organized now talk a lot about individual households and farm, farming systems, but um, women tend to see these as collective and societal action. And this tend to organize. You must have seen so many women going out to the fields, collecting uh, seeds, putting, uh, doing storage work, doing the winnowing, or even collecting fuel fodder. There's always a collective action behind this. And even now when they're forming FPOs for food processing, for grain banks, for seed banks, it's the women who are doing this. And it is this social um, fabric and this cultural ethos of collective resource and community farming that is really keeping the economy sustained for the poor and marginal farmers. And these are aspects we really need to consider when we are designing technology and trying to make it appropriate and oriented to the needs of the majority of farmers because the majority are women, because the majority are marginalized and have very low asset um, access. Yeah. Yes, Yes, just just um, lagging a few of the issues that we should take into consideration. Yes, ma'am. And that is actually very useful because some of the keywords that you mentioned are actually resonating with what is happening uh, globally. So, and especially in the global south, in terms of like unaccounted work, they are working. Uh, then, secondly, the th whole idea of collective well being. Uh, so, these are positives that are coming out. But do you see? that these positives of women farmers or how they can work at sustenance and they, ha they are already contributing so much to food security. Uh, sorry, ma'am, is there a problem with the audio? Yes, I'm going to switch off my video because I didn't hear you properly. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, I, I was just saying that uh, Hello? the point... Yes, ma'am. Hello? Hello? Repeat. Yeah, can you hear me, ma'am? Hello, sorry, sorry for the glitch. Uh, ma'am, is it? Okay, ma'am, I'll just pause for a minute here and I'll come back to you and uh, especially thank you for putting forward your points, but uh, until the net connectivity is a little better, I'll just uh, take a similar kind of a stance. Yes. Okay, okay, thank you, ma'am. So basically, I would like to say that your summarization was really useful because it pointed out a lot of things like collective well being, about unaccounted work, and women contributing significantly to food security. Although, you are, although it is mentioned that 42% of uh, the agricultural labor. So that's a very interesting that thing that I would also like to pause and take some inputs from Carol here uh, because she is coming from a completely different geography. Uh, so Carol, what is your reflection of the role that women play in agriculture in East Africa as a whole? Thank you, Shujit. And it was really nice to hear um, Madame Soma's points, uh, which are not that different from the situation in Africa. Um, and so, just like she said, uh, women in East Africa and Africa really at large uh, do comp comprise about 50% or more of the agricultural labor force. Uh, but what you'll find is that majority of women are engaged in 
the very primary uh, agricultural practices. So that's everything from land clearing, planting, weeding, um, harvesting, and sort of primary post-harvest activities. Um, but you're not um, seeing as many women in the larger scale processing, in the packaging, in the export uh, sectors of agriculture. And you know, on my side, I feel like that is where uh, the opportunity still is for women um, in agriculture in Africa. Um, a good example in my work as an investor was seeing that when you have women uh, participating at the higher end of the value chain, um, they tend to have uh, a bigger pool on women um, engaged in the entire value chain. And what I mean by that is, you know, working with, uh, for example, a big rice scheme up in northern Uganda, uh, which was started by a woman um, who really basically introduced rice in this community, um, started with 20 women because, you know, this was very uncultural to have a woman trying to start being agriculture businesses. Um, and, you know, that later grew uh, into 10,000 women in five years. Um, and she was able to build a whole community around rice growing, which was not just about uh, women participating in the agriculture side of the business, but uh, women started getting involved in the small scale processing. And she was able to start a cooperative that also enabled women to secure their financing and also be able then to make uh, better financial decisions. Um, and that was, uh, because that's also a big challenge here in agriculture, is that even when women participate, um, like uh, Madame Soma said, this is still uh, expected to be your participation as a woman in a household. So very rarely do women actually earn, you know, uh, an income equivalent to their labor contribution. And rarely then uh, do women uh, have a, say in the financial decisions, whether they would want those decisions focused on the household or on growing the businesses. Um, and so with this particular rice scheme, as this woman created a cooperative where for all the harvest to grow, your account was immediately credited. So uh, only a small percentage of cash was handed over uh, for you know the men in the household to <laughs> do with whatever they wanted. And then women could channel uh, their financial decisions through the cooperative. So anything from paying tuition, buying some land, starting another small business. Um, and so that created this really sense of uh, financial security and inclusion uh, for the women in this district. And for me, that's a very, very good example where you see uh, when women start to participate at the higher end um, of the value chain, they know for a fact that you know, they will have to empower more of the women at the beginning of the value chain in order to get, you know, even more farmer loyalty, which is a big issue in East African markets, um, and also get a sense of, um, you know, it's not just that you're a farmer uh, and a woman in a household having to weed, but you're actually earning significantly for it. Uh, for your contribution. So we do still have a long way to go in East Africa. I think the other opportunity that um, would definitely transform women's participation is the issue of land ownership. I mean, if that was <laughs> one single thing that could change, it would definitely uh, uh, open a lot more doors for women to participate and be compensated and make uh, even stronger decisions because we've also seen that women in agriculture will um, will always bring back their income into growing their, their households, taking the children to school, paying medical bills. So the land ownership thing is still a very big question. I think we also still have about 2% of women who actually own land and assets. Um, some African governments are trying to intervene to how, you know, changing inheritance laws, but uh, that does seem to still be uh, a long ways away, but um, that, that's another opportunity, I would say, that um, would really shift the course of women participation in agriculture. Okay. 
thank you so much for that carol and uh, this also brings me back to what soma mamet said that in both geographies there are a few things in common so one is that in terms of decision making still uh, women don't play a lot of role in decision making at the farms secondly the land ownership problem was also highlighted with soma mamet and it's also uh, been highlighted in east africa so and uh, what you mentioned there was a very uh, good point that came out that moving women up in the value chain moving them up the value chain has a very substantial business case and also a social case out here so i would like to talk, come back to soma ma'am on this and ask her about her perception on whether you see technology as a key influencing factor or a key uh, key mode to help women move up the value chain in agriculture and uh, breaking the gender stereotypes do you see a role of technology in breaking gender stereotypes and helping move uh, women up the value chain Uh, you addressing that to me yes ma'am yes ma'am so ma okay um well i do see technology as significant um in uh, factor enabling women to participate more actively unfortunately technology has been seen more in terms of uh, you know the implements that are coming into the agricultural field and that to in a stereotypical way that confine and reinforce the gender division of labor ke aurat agar ye kaam if women are engaged in particular activities give them tools that will help them do those activities more efficiently and be done with it and that to the tools are created in a way that is very often too tacky there's very little innovation very little upgradation and quality norms are seldom adhered to when technologies for jobs that women are doing on the farms are addressed i don't know if time will start and others would uh, vouch for that too in their part of the world but we see that all too often in india so one part of it is upgrading the activity uh, the technology applications for the work that women are already doing but i'd like to uh, submit here that technology is not just about tools and implements technology is also about systems how are you approaching agriculture as an activity how are you seeing it as a system of production uh, activities coming together and to what extent then are you integrating women's needs priorities experience concerns as well as knowledge into that system of production so that they are coming up not only coming up in the value chains and becoming visible actors managers and decision makers but that the technology is to be able to facilitate those kind of roles are appropriate to the skills that they can manage best not everything has to be aggregated to a macro level it has to be aggregated or uh, uh, done collectively to a level where it is optimal to the consumer and the producer and in that sense at this covid time especially it's become very starkly clear that we need to look at activities and organization of production systems that are going to be more localized decentralized and in control of the producers themselves so that they can manage and control the benefits as well as the uh, outflows from the production systems in order to ensure well being it's not just about creating big markets for the produce it's about ensuring well being across the country across the globe so that communities have access to the uh, inputs as well as to the outputs for their own consumption as well as for the uh, well being of others in urban and rural areas um The, uh, so we see this as a system issue and um, uh, there are three things that we would like to highlight in this one is if you look at uh, for instance i take an example the sri system this uh, uh, you know the uh, intensification of rice cultivation uh, i think it's important to understand how that has played a kind of double edged game for women it has improved the uh, uh, the outputs in terms of productivity all the reports are saying that it helps in increasing productivity not necessarily yields so those who are small holders of land are managing to get 
much more out of that land at less input cost, including less irrigation. But the intensity of labor required for SRI cult um, um, rice cultivation has increased the burden that women are um, bearing as um, persons who are invisible family farm labor. So how do we address this in the system? Have we really innovated to ensure that those systems are, I saw a, a small machine for transplantation that prevents bending. Such a little innovation and yet so marvelous in terms of enabling women to use that, but also when and how these things need to be done, are women actually getting involved in those management processes becomes as important as which fields. And they recognize the soil and the fields and the winds and the moisture content as closely as anybody, uh, much more closely than anybody else, in fact. So are we factoring those things into the technology solutions that we are offering? And stop here, I think. Yeah, that's, a, that's a very yeah. good point you made that uh, first thing that you mentioned is that technologies are, that are there are mostly in the form of implements which are actually keeping women in their existing gender roles. But what we need here is a complete systemic change. And I think at this point of time, I would like to rope in Kunal because his company is doing a systematic change in agriculture the way, like by digitizing agriculture, using data for agriculture, it's a very innovative way to transform agriculture. So, but before I start off uh, with my questions, Kunal, I would like to show a, a, a video on uh, one of Cropping's women-centric programs. So I would request Charu to play it. It's a little longish, but it's like one of the best case studies that I have seen in this space using technology for women empowerment. Globally, agriculture is one of the most climate sensitive of all economic sectors. Climate change will not only make it more difficult to feed the projected 10 billion people by 2050, but its impact is already being felt in the form of reduced yields and more frequent extreme weather events that affect crops and livestock. Among the developing nations, India is one of the biggest agro-based economies where nearly 70% of rural households rely on it for their sustenance. These farming communities thus need to be empowered to build climate resilience, to not just safeguard their livelihoods, but also to ensure that agriculture remains productive and sustainable. Cropin has partnered with the World Bank and the Government of India as a technology provider in the sustainable livelihoods and adaptation to climate change. SLACC project. पहले तो खेत कभी हम लोगों को अंजादा नहीं था कि कितना कहता है पांच कठा का छह कठा बोलते थे सात कठा बोल देते थे मोबाइल के माध्यम से नाप के अपना ठेकान से पांच छह कठा कर खेत रहने हम लोग बोलते हैं लेकिन नापते हैं तो पांच एक कठा होता है पहले हम लोग घर में ही रह के काम करते थे और जब हम इससे जुड़े हैं तो हम लोग बाहर भी कहीं निकलते हैं तो इसमें लाभ यही है कि समय समय पर हमको सब जानकारी मिल जाता है जैसे खेत में हम लोग फसल लगाते हैं तो उसमें अगर कोई बीमारी हो जाती है तो उसके बारे में दवाई के बारे में बताया जाता है नुकसान होने वाला मौसम की जानकारी के बारे में बताया जाता है पशु बीमार पड़ता है या उसको कैसे हम देखभाल करें उसको कब किस समय टीका लगाएं उसके बारे में हमको बताया जाता है मैसेज से इससे पहले तो हम लोग का कुछ नहीं फायदा था जब बारिश आता था तब सब बाहर में आता था भीज जाते थे अब तो नहीं भीजता है कोनो चीज के प्रॉब्लम पड़े है तब बीआरपी जी से पूछे छे बीआरपी जी सारा चीज बता दे वही वही हिसाब से हम काम करे छे बोर्ड पर लिखते हैं जो दरवाजा पर आता है वो दीदी भी पढ़ लेती है जो पढ़ी लिखी रहती है सो पढ़ लेती है समझ जाती है कि हां ये मैसेज ठीक आया हुआ है सही है हमको अच्छा काम करेगा तो अपना दीदी लोग पढ़ लेती है जो नहीं पढ़ी लिखी है सो मेरे दरवाजा पर कोई रहता है नहीं तो बीआरपी भैया आता है तो वो भी पढ़कर बता देता है अपना इससे ये है कि सामाजिक फायदा भी और हमारा खुद का भी फायदा है एट द एंड ऑफ द 2 ईयर इंप्लीमेंटेशन the project is a success. This project may 
Mostly, we have covered technical aspects like through partner agencies as Cropin. Cropin was the whole platform that was running on mobile. So, the people who didn't know how to use the phone first, we could learn how to use the phone first. With that, we could make their interaction with the farmers, they could go to the area and audit them, or they could go to the geotagging, they could go to the area and 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 they could go to the area. क्रॉपिन ने एक ऐसा काम किया पूरा डिजिटलाइज प्लेटफॉर्म को हमने ग्राउंड लेवल पे उतारा और उसकी एक्सेप्टेंस को भी हमने बढ़ाया है समय समय पे क्रॉपिन के द्वारा मैसेज आता रहता है जिसमें बीज शोधन के लिए और सोइल के शोधन के लिए उसके साथ क्रॉप में टाइम टू टाइम जिस तरीके से किसान हमारे फर्टिलाइजर प्रयोग करते हैं उसी तरीके से ऑर्गेनिक फार्मोलेशन इसका प्रयोग करते हुए और अपने कॉस्ट को कम करते हुए और अच्छा उत्पादन मिला है Our main objective is to uh, produce climate smart farmers at the end. The farmers at the grassroots level have flourished from this new age digital assistance. Furthermore, Kropin's involvement through the Mahila Kisan Shashakti Karan Pariyojana has ensured that an equal opportunity has been provided to women farmers to encourage economic participation and active decision making. Although climate change is inevitable, the successful implementation of this project has given government bodies, development agencies and other agribusinesses who are adversely affected by climate change a clear vision to build a climate-smart digital agriculture. Crop in technology towards sustainable productivity to make every farm traceable. So uh, this is very interesting to see how you are using technology as a platform to also encourage climate smart agriculture. So in one way, you are also trying to look at cater to livelihoods, improve the decision making capacities of women, and at the other way, look at environmental impact also. So just I wanted to understand from you, because this is a very women centric uh, program. How do you see adoption in this program, like uh, vis a vis in other programs that Coppin is running? Do you see uh, a higher adoption of technology amongst women in this program, or how is it? How does it look like? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question, Srijit. And uh, thank you for playing this video. I think it's, it's quite an encouraging video for us to see the impact that we are creating, uh, leveraging technology, at least at the, at the grassroots level. And more so because we are trying to engage the, the bottom of the pyramid and the women farmers or the smallholder farmers in this particular region. Uh, so primarily what we have seen is that in the, so the World Bank project started in 2017 and it went up to like 2020. Uh, in the three year period that we have seen, like you know, uh, the adoption of the platform initially when you bring in the smallholder farmers will not be that great, right? Uh, but uh, to bring in the stronger adoption within the, because it was mostly a woman led and woman as a beneficiary program, we ensured that all of the, the interventions were driven by women. So all of the village resource personals which were going and meeting these uh, set of farmers in the villages, they were selected as women uh, BLEs. And, they were more comfortable about uh, talking to each other, trying and convincing them about newer technologies. So, so that was the basic framework in which the entire program was designed. Um, so we had almost 200 BLEs, like you no, know, they were all carrying the mobile devices, uh, going in their own villages, and then trying and helping and advising the farmers to, to adopt the newer practices which were more climate resilient. Uh, so the first year of this particular uh, uh, implementation, when we saw we 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 saw that the because it was more about change management, right? Changing your pat, uh, patterns of cropping, changing your time of sowing, uh, changing your practices. And, and these, are, they, these are a little uh, 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 difficult for farmers to adopt before they are really convinced about it. Uh, so the first year went by and, and uh, we tried a lot uh, bringing the community together. Uh, we saw that there was almost 40% um, adoption during the first year uh, of that particular program that we brought in. Uh, but what the program really focused is that you know, we would help each and every single farmer based on the crop and the, and the variety that they're growing in that particular region. So if you saw that video, it had almost 77 different crop varieties. And when we were communicating with the farmers, it was going in the local languages. And it was also giving them specific advices about the weather challenges that they may face, the pests and disease challenges that they face, and give them advices which were very relevant to their crops. Uh, 
So the first year they, they observed that the, whatever we were saying is something that was occurring and, uh, and then they started taking more reactive measures uh, uh, for my help, uh, helping them manage the crops. Uh, the second year, because the advices were that good and the intervention started creating values, it started jumping up. So from 40% in the first year, it went up to close to 50 to 60, around 60% uh, in the second year. And the third year, it was around 88 to 90%, right? So I think it's not, uh, it's not that uh, the, the, uh, it's, it's challenging to implement and, and uh, it's challenging to deliver solutions through women. It's all about how, uh, what is the, the, that you're bringing to the table? What is the quality of the solution that you're bringing? What is the impact it is creating in their livelihoods? And if that is all, uh, it, if that is all secured and if that's all certain, then uh, the adoption is not a challenge. It, it, it picks up very fast. Okay, uh, so that's a, a beautiful way to put this. And one thing that I really liked about your thing was that you said it is for the women by the women, like the village resource personals have been women. So in the deployment stage and the extension services stage, the women are playing a very important role. Uh, like that, would you also have other suggestions that can help increase the adoption of ag tech amongst women, in, uh, irrespective of whether it's a women-centric program or not? What should technology service providers do to increase adoption among women? Um, so, so I think fundamentally what we should also do is like, you know, what we request the government is to bring in central programs where women becomes the enabler of, of these programs. And that's what is the federal government doing, like, you know, the MKSP project that they have is, is women-led, Mahila Kashi Sutaktikirin Pariyojana, right? So this, this enables you know, thousands of people in the villages to get enabled. And what we have seen is once they get enabled and digitally uh, uh, aware of using solutions, they are then moved into being uh, self-led entrepreneurs because since they start interacting with 50, 100 women farmers in their areas, they are much more, they feel much more empowered. They are much more trained. And then they start uh, uh, getting into transactions around selling inputs, uh, giving them nursery, nursery seedlings and advising the, the women farmers, which are then much more accurate for them to adopt, right? So uh, the transition is happening. And then just from being farmers, they are getting converted into agropreneurs and having their own set of library, uh, creating their own set of livelihood from other sources of uh, transaction that they can have. So that's uh, that's one of the things that we have seen. Uh, okay, that, that makes sense. Yeah. Can I add to that, Shujit? Yeah, definitely, Carol. I was coming to you only from an invest per investment <laughs> perspective. So yeah, definitely. Yeah, one of the things I, I wanted to say as well um, to follow up from um, my colleague there, is you know as an investor who you know um, is focused on agriculture but also a lot on gender lens and gender equality what interests me is that a lot of times when we meet um, entrepreneurs trying to uh, set up a digital solution for farmers uh, when we get to the questions around okay uh, which value chains are you interested in? Which uh, farmer focus groups have you talked to? Uh, what's the difference between Western Kenya and, and East, uh, you know, and, and uh, Western Uganda in terms of like uh, farmer culture or agricultural culture? That's normally where we get stuck, you know. That's where we don't normally hear the answers that we're looking for. So a lot of the answers and a lot of the build-up is the excitement around, oh my gosh, the technology can track this using, you know, GPS or using some sort of satellite uh, data. And, and, you know, most of the time, some of these entrepreneurs don't even know what the like in internet infrastructure is, where these smallholder farmers are. So I think what's very important um, is in the design of this technology, uh, that if you want to um, really solve a problem that smallholder farmers are facing, especially women, you have to be intentional in bringing them into the discussion on uh, adoption, usability, uh, infrastructure very, very early on. Uh, what we struggle with is once um, the companies start to try and implement uh, their technology in these rural areas, they start to stumble across so many blocks that they just did not, you know, never thought of testing out. Um, and another thing that's very key is also understanding who are the key influencers, the stakeholders when it comes to agribusiness uh, in, in these parts of the, uh, of the world. Uh, 
government is a big influencer. I mean, he was talking about his weather app. And, you know, we still live in parts of the world where it's the government who uses their district structures to say to farmers, don't plant. I mean, that, that happened here last year. You know, it, we had early rains and uh, the, there was news all over the radios and televisions telling farmers, don't be fooled by the early rains. We're monitoring things. Don't plant. Don't plant. And that's who the farmers are going to listen to, right? So if you're trying to introduce something that changes entirely the way a farmer cycles out his season uh, and you're not uh, partnering or getting uh, support or backing from this one government entity that they all listen to, you're going to have a hard time. You know, same thing with who is buying from the farmers. So if your solution is not quick to either increase their revenue or, you know, safeguard them financially, um, they're not sure. And so you're going to have to test at least two years. And that's like four seasons to even prove to them that what you're saying works. So that there is quite a journey. And I find it difficult when a lot of uh, early entrepreneurs are assuming they're going to hit, you know, 20% adoption in year one. And when that's not happening, <laughs> um, they're still not going down to the grassroots. So I think that's very, very key is, you know, being very intentional very early on, on understanding uh, who are the players, what are women doing, and where are they truly looking for solutions before you create something that people are just not ready to adopt. Thank you, Carol, for that. It's actually a very interesting point, And I'll just uh, like I'll move on to Soma ma'am for some suggestions but three things that really came out from your thing is that first is the intentionality you have to get farmers and women into the entire design, design process and actually have a goodwill that you're planning to do it for the women and involve them through the entire ideation one more thing that came out was the use of influencers like you have to have the right influencers also uh, have, have also deliver the values because farmers listen to them so that's a very important point that's coming out and thirdly what you mentioned was that it has to be like for the technology service providers, I'm saying that since I've worked with a few of them, they have to be patient. And this, and what you said also brings back to what Kunal had also said that once you have the evidence that a uh, technology is creating a difference, then the adoption will naturally increase. So definitely be patient towards the time your uh, solution uh, develops uh, impact and then you use, can use the impact also to leverage on the adoption and increase it. So I also uh, would like to uh, ask Soma ma'am on her perspective because she's working with the grassroots, she's working with farmers on the ground. Soma ma'am, do you have any recommendations for technology service providers so that they can increase the adoption of technologies amongst women farmers specifically? Hello. Uh, so, Mama, I think you're on mute. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, loud and clear. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. There's a lot of in the uh, voice reception at my end for some reason. So I only up what I had said. Very important points, though. And I'd just like to start from the point of what are we talking about in the constraints that women are experiencing. Uh, the lack of access to training you mentioned, that they don't get the opportunities to be part of the training. But having that, they also don't get to have a voice to uh, be able to influence how, which strategies would be appropriate and how and when they need to be applied. So being part of that this is very important. Um, underlying this is this, you know, this whole appropriate we can't look for solutions in the way that we have in the past. We need to look at access to institutional credit, pensions, irrigation sources as a package of services that women and men in communities that are marginalized, and especially in post-COVID times, will need to enable them to have their access to the system to a system of transferring knowledge from one place to the other. Can you uh, repeat the last point that you were mentioning uh, j just a minute back? Yeah. There was some disturbance. I was saying, I was saying there's a need 
looked at innovation as a community process that we need to look at community radio, for instance, in times when we are in special application of technology. We need to look at what will be appropriate having access, as well as control production processes, as well as to the uh, kind of resources that will allow them these kind of applications. Um, just, to, uh, just to say that we cannot uh, keep thinking about investing, for instance, in uh, long food chains, cold storage, cold storage that aggregate to distant from the women. We have to look at com uh, ways of organizing markets and businesses in a way that the consumer is closer and the producer is able to match the sense at their level. So, uh, for instance, in uh, the women from Deccan Development City setting up their direct marketing processes, doing grain banks and seed banks, there has to be risk fund uh, provided for these kind of things. It's not only about insurance, we have to innovate on the financial aspects as well. Similarly, we need to look at the interconnectedness of issues. We talked about um, you know, uh, uh, the production system and enhancing productivity, but the burden of work in other aspects does not decrease. Women cannot be as productive on the fields. So how do we balance that out with innovation and offers? Women can actually access actual entitlements when there is no access to those kind of support systems. So we need to have a combination of efforts that address the embedded uh, intra-household as well as uh, market-related constraints that women are experiencing in access to institutions, access to credit, access to, for instance, irrigation resources, uh, to committees that are making these decisions. And these are all, I believe, part of that technology chain that needs to be addressed in a systems approach. Yeah? Absolutely, ma'am. Um, these definitely make sense. And uh, one of the things that is coming out in the chat box, I think uh, it's a conversation which is coming out very well, is that uh, a lot of the technologies today are digital. And I'll move to Kunal sir on this because he has a lot of experience with digital technologies. So when it comes to digital I technologies, to, the sorry, inter -house... I forgot one point. Can I yes, just sir. add here? Sure, you know, sure, day sure. before yesterday, I had a call from people saying, how do we get more market information? Two communities, one in Hapur and one, one in Bihar, that uh, we want technologies that will help us get market information more quickly so that those who are coming to buy or produce are not undercutting our costs. So those are the kind of information women are already seeking, but our technologies are not helping them to have a local presence in the market system. So that's the kind of thing I was talking about. Yeah, sorry. Absolutely, that's uh, that's absolutely right, and uh, and it links with the sec the question I was about to ask Kunal sir because when we are talking about market information and technologies like this, it can only be dispersed digitally because it's real time information which can be used by farmers. So uh, Kunal sir, like in terms of assets and control over assets, uh, do you find a lack of uh, that? control over the smartphone or, or similar situations hindering adoption amongst women? And do you have any suggestions on the design side in which this, this, this uh, lack of asset of, uh, uh, lack of control over assets can be controlled so that like, for example, you can use IVR instead of smartphones. Do you, are there solutions like that which can uh, overcome this challenge of lack of control of assets amongst women? Uh, yeah, I think that's a, that's a good question. So, so I think, uh, Technology certainly plays a role, but we have to understand the means of communication of, of delivery of services through a technology framework, right? So primarily, if you see, that's the right question that, you know, the mobile phones may not be directly be available with the women farmer. Uh, so many of the programs, like we work with Tata Trust, the Sini project in Jharkhand, and what we have seen is that though the woman is not carrying the device, the younger generation within the family, like the kids, would be carrying a smartphone. And once the information is shared to those kids, I mean, they are very happy to go and share this information to the mom and then the decision is happening, right? So, so these are smarter ways of like bringing, so now what we have done is we have given them farmer application, like these are all for lead farmers within that group of 30,000 farmers. 
and we have seen downloads of close to, to close to 500 farmers which are using this solution now now since people are not able to move in the rural areas these lead farmers are using this platform to basically demonstrate uh, to their co farmers in their area and then the information is shared like so they are different again using from a tech, uh, from a training perspective what we are doing is like you no know, we are we are shooting videos like the, the program is shooting videos where a, a women farmer is basically showcasing that how the technology is being used in in different practices in the farming areas and that video is then broadcasted to the rest of the room so it helps you to empower it helps you to get technically enabled it also helps you in terms of taking decisions i think that's very inform, important because once you have knowledge uh, you can take decisions and unfortunately what was happening earlier is the knowledge was residing with the male farmers and they would come and say that this is what is to be done right and they would just follow that now if you have more knowledge you can go and 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 uh, and discuss within within uh, the group and then uh, and then say this is what what is best suitable for them so i think i think that that information asymmetry and the lack of knowledge which has kept women uh, uh, further away from taking decisions to giving us a good result uh thank you for that kunal so i will move into the question and answers now but uh, just before that one last um, point to so, callum yeah yeah i was again coming to you on this from an investor's perspective again so yeah i guess i just ahead. i just like everyone else's questions right yeah yeah <laughs> but i just wanted to also highlight um two two companies that i've been following since um they started these are african companies that built their entire technology offering um directly on the behavior of women farmers um and so one of them and i'll talk about them really quickly but one of them is called abri supply and it's based out of northern uganda and you know as you probably all know one of the biggest challenges uh, we face in africa on the input side is that there's a lot of counterfeit inputs in the market um and you know the question is always you know while no one wants to have a bad harvest for some reason it's easier to access this um counterfeit inputs at the time of the planting season um and so this company worked directly with women why women are the ones who do the land clearing and the planting and went around doing a lot of focus groups on you know what is really the problem why are you accessing this and not something better and so they built their solution as an input layer way service um where women could save throughout their whole agriculture season before planting season and basically pre-book um the inputs for whatever it was that they're going to plant and this company partners directly with um a more uh certified service provider of input and so at the beginning of the planting season for whichever uh crop these women were going to plant uh they simply came to the store collected their inputs there's no debt in card and were able to go and plant and then the company makes its uh revenue of a commission from the from the input supplier and so this this solution seems really really simple but it was really based on let's just answer the question that women have and the digital side of it is really that um the women just had were given account numbers and you could track your uh you could track your account on your phone and if you didn't want to use a phone you could simply you were given a print out card that looked almost like a debit card but not not really that fancy and then that's what you just bring by deposit your money and then pick up your inputs when you're ready um and the other one is also called uh Taimba in Kenya and this one is connecting women farmers directly to women sellers in the urban areas again that's a big uh, part of the marketing process of agriculture is that still in the urban areas women are uh, the majority in the food markets they are the majority in like the roadside uh, kiosks and things like that and um they always suffer the brunt of uh, middlemen who take out so much of a chunk uh, from you know the transport and cutting the price um and you know making uh, agriculture still seem unattractive and very low margin and so this company just digitally connects the women um the women in the urban areas will make their orders directly by text and the women in the rural areas who are planting will uh collect all the produce which will be collected and delivered by the company so again for me this just comes back to sometimes uh, keeping things simple keeping things directly uh 
towards what is the actual solution um, that these farmers, these women farmers want is, is sometimes the, the, the better way to build out a digital uh, business model, um, especially in, in, in this part of the world where I, I proudly come from. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for that. These two examples were actually very, very, it gave a very field level perspective. So that was very useful. Uh, so uh, in continuation with my questions, I'll also club it with some things that the audience is asking. So this is again uh, for Soma ma'am, I wanted to ask her. Uh, Rajesh sir from Vadwani AI has a very good question which goes beyond technology. In terms of program designs and also technology, do, given your work with women farmers, do you have like two, three points to make these programs and technologies more inclusive for women farmers? What is it that we should look at to make them more inclusive? Um, thank you for that question. It's a very broad, <laughs> broad question, but I think we need to be very specific about two things. One, we cannot solve the problems as Einstein said. We can't use the same kind of uh, frameworks to solve problems that themselves have been created in those frameworks. So we really have to think out, out of the box, yeah? Um, we really have to be innovative in looking at localized and ground solutions. And I'm also looking at the chat, the chat box where someone is talking about FPOs and the FPOs. Um, yes, uh, there, we cannot take the fact that the agriculture sector of land and landless labor and the owners of the resources. We have to strengthen the system such that communities that are the producers themselves are empowered with resources, with information, access to technology, and the way of support from parties to be able to manage those processes more actively. So what my first suggestion would be an institutional innovation that invests in women and men from marginalized sections being the leaders and in adopting a women-centric approach because then you can assume that other layers of the process will also get addressed. The second thing that I'd like to suggest is really looking at the chains of information. Where do they flow from? And how do they in, uh, you know, build on the knowledge that is already with the communities? Yeah, so an innovative bottom-up approach that allows women to share their own experiences and innovate within the box of experiences themselves so that they become the holders of the knowledge as well as the transmitters. This has been done quite successfully in some parts we know about the Dick and Development Society in Hyderabad, but also in Gorakhpur, this has been done. Also in Rajasthan, this has been done. So women themselves as the innovators become the communicators of that knowledge. And we know how that communication system works. It works horizontally, where women themselves speak from an experiential position. The third is about the financial modeling for this kind of process, um, where women themselves are seen as viable and investable, and therefore you center your focus around a women-centric approach to management of resources as a collective. I know the SAG pro, um, approach that exists in India has been talked about a lot, but even within that, there has been a tendency to then individuate it to households and private management of resources and each family getting at the other to repay. We are talking about a collective solidarity, so we are looking much more at investing in solidarity spaces and the social relations that go with that. That's another topic. I think we could take another session on that. Yes. But it's important to recognize how that is the bottom line for resilience for the marginalized farmers, for women farmers. And until we recognize that, the institutional frameworks are going to be, remain capitalist, patriarchal and exploitative. So we really have to do some thinking change, some system change, and then invest in the capacities of women to be able to manage the change. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I'm, I got a uh, question on my personal thing. I like to direct it for Carol. Uh, so this is coming from an impact investor. So they are asking like in terms of uh, ag tech enterprises, what should they do to be more lucrative to investors? Because uh, like 
to prove a model, to prove the impact, it takes some time. But do you have any suggestions on scaling these models so that they'll be more lucrative to raise investments and take it more uh, into the ground? Yes, I, I have a few suggestions. I think first and foremost, what I would say is that anyone who's venturing into um, some sort of uh, tech or digital solution for agriculture must think about it as a business from the beginning. Um, I think one of the challenges investors find is that uh, because there's also a lot of grant funding in the agricultural space, there's a tendency to lean a lot on big grants um, in the beginning with the mindset that, okay, we need a lot of free money to help us research, but sometimes that can be an impediment in really deciding on what business model works. Um, I have to say, first of all, for like uh, a lot of smallholder farmers in Africa, subscription is a very difficult business model to scale. I, I will put it out front, <laughs> up front. That's a very difficult model to scale because it's just not a part of our culture, you know. People are not going to pay you a dollar a week or a month for information. They are not even sure they will be able to use. So anything that you're creating that's only going to take more of the little and income from that household is always going to be harder to scale. So I think one, one way to think about this is having a, a value chain approach. Um, you know, thinking about like which value chains are very organized and benefit a lot from that. So you'd look into things like where there's a lot of need for uh, traceability, for example. So there, within there, you're able to figure out, okay, while this solution might help and be used by the farmer, who will pay for it? Is there a commodity buyer invested enough in making sure that this solution, for whatever it is, whether it's for weather tracking, increased productivity, inputs, whatever it is, who is going to pay? So can you find strong value chains, especially for in your early days, that you know, you know that you know, you don't have to do all the work. I mean, you, you alone as a digital platform are not going to create behavioral change uh, that has existed for centuries. So I think it's very keen uh, understanding, you know, uh, where, uh, w which revenue models would work that you could scale. Uh, how, how is that integrated into your solution? So for example, are you able to put that cost in the input cost without the price going up. Because again, at the end of the day, a digital solution cannot um, guarantee produce. You, you might do everything right as a farmer. And I mean, sorry to use French, but things happen, you know, shit happens and, and things could go wrong. So um, it's very key uh, to make sure that the solution is actually bringing more money into the farmer's pocket. So thinking about, you know, a value chain approach, who, who, who is in that value chain that can pay, who's invested enough, who are you, um, who do you have as a support system, who's, who's behind you, uh, is there government uh, um, collaboration on this? So there, there is quite a journey. And um, I think being able to prove that more than just to prove how interesting the technology is makes a better investment case because I think enough impact investors who got very excited with interesting algorithms and, and, and things in the beginning have, you know, had their hands, their fingers burnt, you know, seriously because, you know, things really didn't uh, get off the ground. So I think focusing on, you know, where is what is this solving? Which value chains? What's the revenue model? Is it actually being adopted and being paid for? Is that continue a repeat customer base uh, really, really matters more than the, uh, the fancifulness of the tech? <laughs> Thank you for that. That is very useful. Uh, so I would like to direct the last question of the day to Kunal. Uh, we are almost at the hour. So uh, Kunal, this is something that again, uh, someone from our network had asked us is that uh, you are running a program, this Jivika program with World Bank, which is specifically for women. And I just wanted to bring out a comparison here. Do you see this program 
perform better or worse in terms of usage of the technology and the outcomes from the use of technology vis-a-vis -vis other programs that Cropin is doing or other clients that Cropin has. So this is just like a, someone wants a comparison on the performance of uh, technology when handed over particularly to women. Yeah, so I think these programs had fared quite well. Uh, the reason was that you know, these were uh, very, very smallholder marginal farmers, which were selected by the government, uh, and mostly in, 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 in climate uh, stressed areas of, of uh, one was flood prone and one was drought prone. So already the framework of that was given to us was very challenging. Uh, but overall, in the, in the three year period, we had seen that overall the net return to the farmer that, that came out was more than 32% from the baseline. So that's a great uh, experience that we had from the program. Uh, what we also left behind is a lot of motivation, a lot of cultural shift of the users, the farmers, 8,000 farmers that we work with, 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 2000, uh, with 200 BLEs. Uh, now many of them are self-sustainable. Uh, and now we are talking to the government that you know, this program from two states should be going to all of the 38 states in Bihar, right? So, so um, we have seen that digital has stayed back even uh, post uh, what we had done the intervention for yeah. and and there is a lot of uh, entrepreneur skills uh, self uh, uh, and change that has that that has been driven from the particular platform so it doesn't just last till the program i think it's a it's the impact that lasts lifelong for all of the beneficiaries that we work with wonderful i think soma ma'am has something to add on this so we'll take her as the last comments on this okay um, I just wanted to say that I'm glad you asked about a women-specific focus. I think uh, within um, innovations that have been tried, the institutional model of investing in women's leadership and decision-making and men being part of the production process and the management process seems to have worked well. As long as the management and control has remained with women, the systems have remained more egalitarian, we find. So invest in women's leadership is one issue. The other is we don't have to think of large and complex technological systems always. We have to think of what works best for the communities that need to benefit from this process, say that living well becomes part of the a process for the producer as well as those who are the beneficiaries of their produce. So we need to think of optimal scales of operation where gadgets and technologies and solutions can be very simple but must be of a quality that communities themselves can use. For instance, pulleys, I mean my Colleagues in the hills will tell you, Roshan is on the group. She'll tell you that simple pulleys have worked so much better than these large, grandiose systems when they um, just don't seem to be suitable for the region. So we need to think of innovations in a way that communities themselves can manage them as well as own them and invest in those kind of processes and institutions. The technologies will get adopted, whether digital or implemental, as soon as people feel that it is directly relevant to their field of production, we won't need to worry about the marketing of the technology itself if it is emerging from the experience of those communities. We have to invest patiently in those processes and understanding those processes, harnessing and as, uh, as well as surfacing those processes more actively. And that will bring its own dividends in terms of benefits, not only profits, but benefits as well. Uh, so we need to move from this kind of a patriarchal framing of the problem. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. thank you so much for that, ma'am. Uh, since we are at the hour, I would request the people in the audience who have further questions to reach out to our panelists directly. I'm sure they'll have a lot more to share, uh, but in the interest of time, uh, we'll be closing now. So uh, at, as a closing note, I would like to thank everyone who's been a part of this session and actually uh, three people from IntelliCap, Charu, Kavya, and Rachel, who have put this together and have been able to drive this whole conversation. Thank you so much. And uh, as IntelliCap, I this we see as a very first step in helping the ecosystem adopt a gender lens towards agricultural technologies. And I, I am very uh, confident that collectively we'll be able to take this forward and create a dent. And over time, that dent will become into a practice and it'll lead to a systemic change. So thank you so much for being a part of this webinar. And thank you so much to the speakers.